Fine. So look at the next question now. So they've given you a signal X n, which is periodic with period of capital N. Then they are asking you to prove these uh, two equations. What they are asking is basically that if they are uh, adding this time period capital N to both the lower limits and upper limits of summation, then the summation is going to remain same. See, logically we can understand this how because if you are uh, summing a signal over some time interval and if you are adding period to both the lower limit and upper limit. Then what is the basic definition of periodicity is that after that time interval, after that period of time, the signal is going to repeat its value. It is going to repeat its shape. So if we are adding the same time period to both the lower limit and upper limit, obviously we're going to obtain the same signal, same shape of the signal after that time period. So the summation is going to be same. Okay. Now we're going to prove that mathematically. Right. So uh, what am I doing is I'm just just replacing k with some new variable some new see we can change the argument right so i'm replacing k with u minus capital n this can be done okay so if i'm letting k is equal to u minus n this u becomes k plus n k plus n right and also xk is going to become x of u minus n now since the signal was periodic with the time period of capital n then what is the definition of periodicity is x u is equal to x of u minus n and also equal to x of u plus n right so this is the definition of periodicity so this x of u minus n is going to be equal to x u now let us look at the limits how the limits are going to change uh, fine first look at the integral this summation k is equal to n naught to n x k is going to become summation limit in terms of u now i'm going to need and in place of k i'm going to put u minus n now see how are limits going to change when k first we are looking at lower limit so u is going to be lower limit when k was the variable was n naught so you put here n naught so lower limit is going lower limit for u is going to be n naught plus n similarly upper limit is going to be small n plus n right and now already we have seen that this x u minus n is equal to x u so this becomes summation u is equal to n naught plus n 2 n plus n x u now see this variable does not make a difference okay here you put u you put k you put v you put any variable this does not make a difference so i'm replacing it with k again okay so this becomes n naught plus n to n plus n summation of x k right With, which is what we had to prove so the addition of uh, the time period of a periodic signal to lower limit and upper limit of its summation over any time interval does not make a difference this is what you had to prove right so this is the proof now look at the second part what are they saying that summation of a signal from 0 to n is going to be equal to okay so this is uh, firstly i'm going to make a correction here this is capital n okay maybe a misprint this is capital n so they're asking you that summation of a signal over its time period is equal to if you are uh, summing a signal over its time period that is from 0 to capital n if you add any constant n naught to lower limit and upper limit it is going to remain same which is true logically you can understand that now we're going to look at it mathematically so for uh, this part what am i doing is i'm starting from rhs considering RHS. I'm starting from RHS. I'm splitting the limit. What am I doing is, see these limits are from n naught to n naught plus n. What can I write them as? I can write them as k is equal to n naught to 0 xk plus k is equal to 0 to n naught plus n. I'm just splitting the limits, okay? xk. I can do this, right? This is allowed. Now, using results of the first part using part one what i can write i can write that k is equal to n naught to zero x k what can i write this is equal to i'm adding i can ca add capital n to both the limits right we have just proved this in the first part so this can be equal to k is equal to n naught plus n to n x k right we've just proved this in first part right so now what does this equation one become this is equation one suppose okay i'm just making a boundary here 
so therefore equation 1 becomes what is equation 1 going to be it's going to become summation k is equal to n naught to 0 x k okay so the summation has become now n naught plus n to capital n x k plus summation summation uh, k is equal to 0 to n naught plus n x k now see uh, we have seen that see these two in summations have this uh, lower limit for this summation is the upper limit for this summation so i can write them combinedly okay this limit can be combined these summations can be combined and what will they become then they will become summation k is equal to 0 to capital n x k which is equal to R lhs okay see here here equal to lhs so we have proved this okay we have proved this part now so uh, addition of any constant if a sub signal is summed over its time period or addition of time period to lower limits and upper limits of a signal does not make a difference, does not change the summation. Right. Look at the next question now. So they are uh, basically asking about scaling of impulse signal. How is scaling of impulse signal affecting in continuous time domain and in discrete time domain? Fine. So firstly, we are going to look at this uh, this signal continuous time signal. First, we are going to look at it logically how this is happening and then we are going to look at it mathematically. Now see, when we define this impulse signal graphically in continuous time domain, we say that it is a generalized function. It is a pulse function area under which is going to be unity. So we defined it like if these limits are minus epsilon by 2 and plus epsilon by 2, then this value must be 1 by epsilon. This value must be 1 by epsilon so that area under the pulse becomes 1, right? And where we consider that these epsilon is, this is epsilon limit, epsilon tends to 0. So that the signal occurs only at one value of t which is t is equal to 0 and its value tends to infinity, right? If you put epsilon tends to 0, the value of this impulse is going to tend to infinity. Also, this signal is going to exist only at one point which is t is equal to 0. So this is how we define del uh, t, right? Now see, if I am scaling this time with 2, which means that Okay, suppose this is del t. This is just definition of del t, right? Now, if I want to scale it by 2, what happens? All the time instances are going to get multiplied by 2. So, this is going to become epsilon. This is going to become minus epsilon. Now, this is how, this is how this pulse is going to exist. This is how the pulse is going to exist. This is del of 2t. Now what happens to the value? Now see the duration of this pulse has become 2 of silence. So what do I have to do? Its value must become 1 by 2 of silence so that the area remains unity only. Right? The, it, for the area to remain unity only, its value must become 1 by 2 of silence. Which is why we say that whenever we are time scaling a unit impulse signal, any signal del AT, what happens this a is going to come outside and divide its value value this is the property right now you have seen the logical proof of this property why this is happening because whenever you are time scaling the signal the, the pulse is going to spread in time so for the area to remain unity what we have to do is we have to divide its value by the same scaling factor now why are we putting this mod c Time reversal is not going to make any difference to this pulse, right? If you Even if you reverse it in time, it is an even signal. Even if you flip it, it is going to remain the same, okay? But if you divide the value by a negative constant, it is going to flip across x-axis, which we do not want, okay? We just want to divide the value so that the area remains unity. If you divide it by minus 2, this is going to go down. This pulse is going to occur on negative axis, which we do not want. That is why we are putting the mod here. Now, this is the logical explanation of this uh, signal, okay? Why, why this property is occurring. Now, we have a mathematical proof also. We are going to look at uh, it also. Now, uh, see, for two functions, for two functions, g1t and g2t be equal, 
G1T and G2T be equal, where these G1T and G2T are generalized functions. Where G1T and G2T are generalized functions. Now see this this impulse that we are talking about, this is a generalized function, okay. So these G1T and G2T are somewhat impulse functions, okay. G1T and G2T are generalized functions. So for these two functions to be equal, we are having a property which is minus infinity to infinity phi t G1T dt must be equal to minus infinity to infinity phi t G2T. Now this phi t that we are talking about, this is a testing function, okay. This is some random testing function. We are just considering it to check this equivalence, okay. So this is, this is quite obvious, okay. Now what am I doing is, it's fine. Now what am I doing is, uh, considering g1 t, I am considering this g1 t equal to del of 2 t, del of 2 t. Now what happens to this integral? Okay, fine, let us see. Now what happens to this integral? This integral becomes minus infinity to infinity phi t into in place of g1t. What am I having now? Del 2t dt. Fine, now what do I do? I am introducing a new variable, okay. Let, let 2t is equal to tau. Okay, then what happens? I am differentiating this partially. 2 dt becomes d tau and what do t become t is going to be equal to tau by 2 now i'm putting all these values see uh, limits are not going to change because even if you put infinity minus infinity the limits for tau are going to be same so this becomes minus infinity to infinity phi of in place of t you're going to put tau by 2 del of tau and in place of dt you put d tau by 2 now see we know a property of this delta function right which is Fine. Uh, let me put it this way. This is going to be phi, uh, value of phi of t by 2 at tau is equal to 0 and, and again 1 by 2. This 1 by 2 is going to come out. Now this is 1 by 2 phi of 0. Right? This is what I can write it. Right? Now I can also write this phi of 0 as minus infinity to infinity phi t into del t. Right? This is equally correct, okay. A value of this is also going to be phi 0 only. Now, from equivalence of equation 1 and equation 2, if I just equate equation 1 and equation 2 from the basic definition that we used, right, for two general functions to be equal, what can I say? Equating equation 1 and equation 2, what do I get? del of 2t is equal to 1 by 2 into del t, right? This is what I'm going to get. Fine, now you see how we obtain it mathematically. Now see, if this was any other constant, suppose it was minus 2, then there would have been a difference, okay? We've got a, we've, we've got a mod here, right? For now, we're getting this one. Fine, so this is how we're getting this, okay? Now see, what happens in discrete time? In discrete time, see this is how we are defining this del n. Del n is a sample of value 1. Value 1 which occurs for n is equal to 0 only. Right? Now, if even if you scale this uh, discrete time signal, even if you divide it by 2, multiply it by 2, it is not going to make any difference. Okay, This is going to remain a single sample at n is equal to 0 only. Which is why scaling operation in discrete time impulse does not make any difference. And this del 2n is going to be equal to del n only. This is not going to make any difference. This is not going to divide its value also. Okay. Why? Because this is this is not having a definition. This is actually not uh, obtained by sampling the continuous time units uh, impulse signal, right? This is a special function which has its unique definition. This is just a sample of value 1 which occurs for n is equal to 0 only. So even if you scale this in uh, this discrete time, it is not going to make a difference. This is going to be a single sample at n is equal to 0 only. Since 0 by 2 is 0 only, okay? So this del 2n is equal to del n only. Fine. Uh, now look at the next question. 
so they are asking you to show that del dash of minus t is equal to minus of del dash t now see this is a tricky question i would like you to take a note of this question right this is something important also this property you should keep in mind otherwise also and you should also pay heed to its derivation this is quite important okay this is going to help you in uh, a lot of places also so we using the same uh, definition that we used earlier which is for uh, two general functions g1t and g2t to be equal this property should be satisfied that is phi t into g1t must be equal to minus infinity to infinity phi t into g2t right for this g1t and g2t to be equal first property that i am using is this one now there is one more property for this uh, del t that i am going to make use of right this is uh, one property that i am going to use this is the second property integration from minus infinity to infinity of phi t into g to the power n now what is this this is nth derivative of the generalized function nth derivative of the impulse function into dt this is going to be equal to minus 1 to the power n nth derivative of this testing function into gt see this is the second property now uh, it would be better if you just remember these two properties because they are going to be used in derivations okay what is this gnt i am going to write it here this gnt is actually the nth derivative okay this is the nth derivative okay suppose if if i am writing example is if i am writing g square t this is going to be second derivative d2 y by dt square the d2 g by dt square this is nth derivative and similarly phi and t is also the nth derivative of the testing function g1 t g2 t are the generalized function phi t is the testing function as in the previous part so uh, this is one property that we are going to use now what am i doing okay what i am i am considering this uh, fine i'm considering gt as del dash of minus t del dash of minus t now what does this integral become this becomes minus infinity to infinity phi t del dash of minus t into dt now value of n in this equation is 1 because we are having only one dash only one derivative now what do i do i'm considering one different variable uh okay let tau is equal to minus t one new variable tau then d tau is going to be equal to minus dt limits are going to be infinity to minus infinity limits are going to reverse because i have considered this as minus t right this is going to be phi of minus tau this is going to become del dash of tau into d tau and an additional minus sign okay from here right now if i want to reverse the limits okay you must know this property of integration if you want to reverse the limits you have to multiply the integral by minus 1 so this becomes see already one minus was there i am multiplying again with minus 1 so this becomes minus infinity to infinity phi of minus tau into del dash tau d tau right now using this property to using this second property what happens minus 1 to the power of 1 okay into integration of minus infinity to infinity this is going to become del dash of minus tau then you're going to have differentiation of this argument also which is going to be minus 1 chain rule right firstly you differentiate the function then you differentiate the argument so this this is the differentiation of the function into integration a uh, differentiation of argument minus 1 into this is going to become del tau d tau fine now this minus 1 minus 1 is going to multiply so this is going to become fine so this is going to become equal to integration of minus infinity to infinity del dash minus tau del del tau d tau right which is equal to we know this property okay this is going to be phi dash of minus tau value at t is equal to 0 which is phi dash of 
right this is phi dash of 0 now see using the property okay uh, I'm writing the property again to avoid confusion we use this property okay into phi t del dash t dt is equal to minus 1 to the power n find this this uh, it's going to be n minus infinity to infinity phi n t into del t dt okay if you just look at this if you just look at this if i want to simplify this what is this going to become minus 1 to the power n phi n of 0 okay and if you put n is equal to 1 here this is going to be minus phi dash 0 now you have obtained phi dash 0 only you did not obtain minus sign so what can i write this phi dash 0 as minus of minus infinity to infinity phi t del dash t dt i can equate it to the lhs with the minus additional minus sign okay now when we started this integration we had phi del, del dash minus t now if i just equate if this is equation 2 and the previous was equation 1 then equating equating 1 and 2 equating 1 and 2 what do we obtain that del dash of minus t is going to be equal to minus del dash t del dash of minus t is always going to be equal to minus del dash t okay so this is important property just remember this okay and remember the proof also fine uh, now look at the next question so they are asking you to evaluate the given integrals fine so we're going to uh, do this one by one uh, so look at the first part now they're asking you to evaluate okay wait. they're asking you to evaluate integration from minus infinity to t cos tau u tau d tau now see whenever you're multiplying a signal with this unit step function unit step which starts from t is equal to 0 this function is going to occur only from tau is equal to 0 onwards which is why i can easily modify the limits from 0 to t why because this function is not going to exist from minus infinity to 0 anyways right this is the definition of ut and value for this uh, value of this function from 0 to uh, t or whatever point is going to be 1 so what can i write it i can just simply write it as integration cos tau d tau now what is going to be the integration of cos tau we know that integration of cos tau is sine tau with limit 0 to t now upper limit minus lower limit you know the value of sine 0 is going to be 0 so the final answer is going to be sine t sine t right next part is integration of minus infinity to t cos tau del tau d tau fine now see we've already seen this kind of problems okay this this uh, function is going to be value of cos at point of occurrence of delta now this is occurring at occurs occurs at tau is equal to 0 t is equal to 0 now if this tau is equal to 0 is included in the limits of integration then this is going to exist if it does not contain this is integral is going to be 0 so what can i say this is going to be equal to cos tau at at tau is equal to 0 fine which is cos 0 1 but only if now this depends on limit okay we are not sure about t this is going to be 1 if t is greater than 0 if t is greater than 0 that is t is equal to 0 is included in limits this is going to be 1 if t was less than 0 something before t is equal to 0 only negative instances of time this integral is going to be 0 and this integral is not going to be defined not defined if t had been 0 if this was integration from minus infinity to 0 this integral would have not been defined okay point of existence of delta t should be included in the limits of integration fine this is the rule that we are following fine now look at the next part integration minus infinity to infinity cos t u t minus 1 del t dt now see 
This is a shifted unit step signal. This step signal starts from t is equal to 1 and will have value 1. So this integral is going to become, this is going to exist only from t is equal to 1 to infinity. And the, what is going to be the value of unit step then? 1. So this becomes cos t delta t dt. Now see, since this, this delta t occurs at occurs at t is equal to 0 but that is not included in the limits right the limits this time interval starts from t is equal to 1 and till infinity since this is not included this integral is going to be simply 0 this limits of integration must include the point of occurrence of this delta t okay fine look at the last part integration 0 to 2 pi t into sine t by 2 del of pi minus t dt now see, uh, this del of pi minus t can also be written as, right, so I am writing this as sin t by 2 into del of minus 1 into t minus pi. Uh, now you know the scaling property of this delta function, right, this, this minus 1 more will going, is, if you want to take it outside, we are going to divide it by 1, which is going to be the same only, okay. So what happens, this is going to be integration from 0 to 2 pi t into sin t by 2. What happens to the delta function, it is going to have 1 by mod of minus 1 into del of t minus pi. This is how it is going to become, right. Now this becomes 0 to 2 pi t into sin t by 2. You know that mod of minus 1 is going to be 1 into del of t minus pi. Now see, where does this delta function occurs? This occurs at t is equal to pi, which is included in the limits of integration. Pi occurs between 0 and 2 pi, which is why what is going to happen? We are going to have t into sin t by 2 at, at what value? t is equal to pi, which is going to give us pi into sin pi by 2. Now you, that, uh, you know that sin pi by 2 is 1. So this is going to be pi. This is going to be the answer. Fine. Now look at the next question, question 11. Uh, okay. So they are given a continuous time system with the input output relation as follows. And they are asking you to determine whether the system is linear, time invariant, causal, everything you have to check. Linearity, time invariance and causality of the system. Fine. So, uh, okay. Now see, this is a simple integration function. Uh, we've already seen this, whatever the limits be. Integral function is always linear. Uh, so I don't think I need to do it again. You know that you have to check homogeneity and superposition. I'm not performing it. I'm uh, writing directly. Integral is a linear system. Uh, if you're given a question like this in exam, you need to check homogeneity, superposition. We have done it several times. That is why I'm just avoiding it. So this is going to be a linear system. Now to check time invariance of this system, what am I going to do? Firstly, I am going to make a shift of t0 in the signal which makes this uh, function as 1 by t into t minus t by 2, t plus t by 2 and this is going to become x tau minus t0 d tau. Now, if I want to make it of this form, the form in which is given in question, what do I do? I consider a new variable, suppose u, which is equal to tau minus t now. Now, du is equal to be d tau. And how are limits going to uh, change? If you put the lower limit when tau was variable, then for uh, u, the limits are going to be t minus t by 2 minus t naught. And upper limit is going to be t plus t by 2 minus t naught. And this is going to become x u d u. So this is what happens when I am uh, making a shift of t naught in the signal, in the excitation, in the input. Now, if I make a similar shift in the output, y t minus t naught, it is going to be equal to 1 by t. See, we have discussed this already. If you are making a shift of t naught, this is not going to affect the input, okay? The function, the integral, the system is this integral, okay? Not this, we are not concerned with the argument of the input. So, it is just going, we are just going to replace this t with this t minus t naught. So, this becomes t minus t naught minus t by 2 and t minus t naught plus t by 2 which is equal to this this thing okay which is equal to this okay 
x tau d tau. Since one and two equations are equal, that is by making same shift in the in excitation, same shift occurs in the response. So this function is going to be is going to be time invariant. Time invariant, right? This is how we are checking time invariance, right? Now to check causality of the system, how are we doing it? We're just going to see, we're just uh, seeing that whether this value of the signal, value of the input starts from t is equal to 0 or before that. Now see uh, here, see here, the value starts from t minus t by 2 which means that this system is not going to be causal. This is a non-causal system. Okay, since value does not start from t is equal to 0, this is going to be a non-causal system. This, this values are from t minus t by 2 to t plus t by 2. Fine, so this is a non-causal system. Right. Look at the next question now. Uh, now they've given a continuous time system with this linear input-output relation and they're asking you to check linearity as well as time invariance of the signal. Now see, uh, Firstly, we are going to check linearity. To check linearity, we are going to check homogeneity and superposition. So, what do I do? If I multiply the signal, uh, this uh, excitation with a x t, it's going to yield integration minus infinity to infinity a x t del of t minus k t s. If I multiply output with the same constant, it's going to be same. Okay. Because any constant can, can come out of summation, okay? So this is going to be same. So this satisfies, satisfies homogeneity. Okay. And to see uh, its uh, superposition also is, uh, okay, very easy, okay? Just replace it with two signals. See, integral, summation, all these are going to be linear operators. Why? Uh, we've seen them separately, okay? This mul multiplication with this is not going to make a difference. You can just check. So this system is going to be linear. So some summation just linear fine uh, now just uh, look at this since this is a continuous time system okay see placing the summation in place of integral is not going to make a difference this is a continuous time system basically value of this thing value of this is going to be x t at t is equal to k t s because this is an impulse, this is multiplied with an impulse which occurs at t is equal to kts. So this is going to be actually equal to x of kts. Right. Fine. Now, see what happens if to check time invariance, what I am doing is, if I make a shift of t0 in the signal, what is going to happen? This is going to become summation k is equal to minus infinity to infinity x of t minus t naught only shift is going to happen in x t right into del of t minus k t s now using the same property what happens what happens what is what does this uh, come out to be this is going to be x of t minus t naught minus k t s using this this property okay similar property right now if i make a shift of fine if i make a if i try to make a shift of t naught in y if i try to find out y of t minus t naught what is going to happen see if i am making a shift of t minus t naught in the output what happens is all t everywhere is going to be replaced by t minus t naught only this is going to become t minus t naught this is also going to become t minus t naught minus kts which is equal to see i can write I can write this uh, impulse like this, right? T minus T naught plus KTS. Now this impulse occurs at T naught plus KTS, which means this is going to be equal to T minus T naught minus T naught minus KTS, which is T minus 2 T naught minus KTS, which was not the same when we shifted the signal with this excitation. So this is going to be a time varying system. This is not time invariant, okay? This is going to be a time varying system due to presence of this delta function, right? Uh, look at the next question now. So they have given a discrete time system with the given input output relation and they are asking you to verify the system is linear and time invariant. Fine, so first we are checking linearity. How do we check linearity? We are considering uh, one x1n, 
which is equal to axn now what is going to happen for uh, this signal x1 square n is going to be equal to a square x square n uh, and if you are multiplying this a with the uh, y1 n it is going to become a x square n which is not the same okay so this function is not uh, satisfying homogeneity so this is going to be a non-linear system non-linear system right now you have to check its time invariance uh, for which what do you do is i'm going to make a shift of n not c for checking time invariance of discrete time signals also procedure is going to remain same okay firstly you are going to make a shift of n not to the signal n not to the signal which is going to yield x square of n minus n not if i make a shift of n not to the output it is also going to yield the same okay because only the argument is going to be affected even if this function is squared so this is going to be a time invariant system time invariant because a change shift of n naught in the uh, excitation produces a corresponding shift of n naught in the output in the response so this is time invariant but non-linear right now look at the next question so they're asking you uh, an example of a system that satisfies homogeneity but not additivity now see for uh, any system of this kind which satisfy homogeneity, homogeneity means multiplying by a constant, multiplying input by a constant, the output uh, gets multiplied with the same constant. Okay, so homogeneity must be satisfied but additivity should not be. See, if we do not want additivity to be satisfied, we need to play with the powers, okay. If a system is having some power, some uh, power of the input that is square, cube, 1 by 2, additivity is not going to be satisfied. But if you only power put power to the input, homogeneity is also not going to be satisfied. So what do I do? I need the powers to cancel themselves for satisfying homogeneity. Okay, so I'm considering a one system like this. Just see. Integration. Integration from any limits A to B of x square t dt whole to the power 1 by 2. Now see, when you are checking homogeneity, when you check homogeneity, suppose, suppose I am replacing xt with axt. What happens? What happens to the input first we are looking? Okay, this becomes a to b, a square x square t dt whole to the power 1 by 2. Now since this is just a constant, it is going to come out of the integration and having power 1 by 2, so this is going to become a into a to b x square t dt whole to the power 1 by 2 which is equal to a into yt which is equal to a into yt right you can see so this is satisfying homogeneity but this is not going to satisfy superposition why because this this signal is having square so when i replace it with addition of two signals it is going to yield one term which has product of the two signals okay which is not satisfying superposition right since uh, we've seen uh, see we've just considered this integral operation because it is a linear operator it is a linear operator which means that this a this constant could come out okay and satisfy if i had not considered this integral operation only powers okay these would have cancelled out and it would have become a linear operation right <coughs> they're asking you to give an example of a linear time varying system time varying system such that with a, a periodic input the corresponding output is not periodic okay so they want that even if the input is periodic the output should be non-periodic and the system should be time varying okay so i am defining uh, i'm see there can be multiple examples i am giving one of them okay so i'm considering this example see this is a time uh, varying system why because uh, if you okay firstly i'm going to check it for time variance x of n minus n naught is going to yield n into x of n minus n naught whereas y of n minus n naught is going to yield n minus n naught into x n minus n naught which is not the same so this is going to be a time varying system and now even if this xn is periodic if even if this xn is a periodic signal multiplying it with n is going to make it non-periodic since this n is non-periodic right so multiplication of periodic and non-periodic is going to be non-periodic so this is the required example there can be multiple examples you can think of something else also okay 
right now look at the last question so they are talking about inverse systems. We have seen about inverse systems already. Uh, so we have seen that there are two conditions. If two same inputs correspond to the same output, if two different inputs correspond to the same output, then a system is not invertible. And second condition is if a non-zero input corresponds to a zero output, then the system is non-invertible. Other than that, all the systems are going to be inverse system. So they are asking you to identify if the system are invertible or not and if they are invertible they are asking you to find the inverse system now look at the first part y t is equal to 2 x t so here no two signals no two values of x t can yield the same value for y t if x t is unique y t is going to be unique okay so this is invertible invertible and how are we finding the inverse system x t is equal to 1 by 2 y t which is unique unique okay you can just find the inverse system and see if it is giving a yielding and unique value for all yt that is also how you can check if the system is invertible or not now look at the second part yt is equal to x square t now see uh, even if i inverse the system i am going to yield plus minus yt which means that for for two values of xt this yt is going to be same for plus xt as well as minus xt yt is going to yield the same value since two different inputs uh, correspond to same output the system is going to be non-invertible non-invertible because it is not satisfying the condition okay two different inputs should not yield same output right now this yt integration from minus infinity to uh, minus infinity to t see we know that this integration is going to yield the area under the graph okay minus infinity to t yields the area time uh, area time varying area under this graph of xt so this is going to be an invertible system see uh, this integral uh, operator is not always going to be invertible okay it depends on the limit it depends on the limit whether it is invertible or not this this system is going to be invertible and the inverse system is going to be xt can be obtained by differentiation differentiation why did this happen because the limit from minus infinity to t we had limit from minus infinity to t so this is going to be the inverse system next part now this is just the discrete time equivalent of this one okay uh, what am I doing is to, so I am sure that this is invertible since this is just a uh, summation. How are we uh, obtaining its time in, uh, I mean inverse system? See, I can write this yn as integration, oh sorry, summation minus infinity to n minus 1. Okay, just one step before plus plus x of n right this is actually samples adding samples from minus infinity till n so what did i do i wrote it as summation okay sorry summation of from k is equal to minus infinity to n minus 1 of xk plus xn i just took out one sample now see when the summation was from minus infinity to n i called it yn now the summation is from minus infinity to n minus 1 so i can call it as y n minus 1 plus xn this is yn from here i can write xn is equal to yn minus yn minus 1 so this is the inverse system inverse system of summation summer is going to be difference differentiation or uh, difference okay difference sir so this is the inverse system x n is equal to y n minus y n minus one this is how you can obtain the inverse of this in the summer okay right uh, now look at the last part so see here we have y n is equal to n into x n now see this is not an inverse invertible system why because even if even if x n is not equal to zero for n is equal to 0, n is equal to 0. Okay, what happens? y of 0 is going to be 0 into x of 0. 
now if x0 is not equal to 0 even if x0 was not equal to 0 we got y0 equal to 0 so this is not satisfying the condition we already discussed this right there are two conditions for a system to be invertible first condition is different inputs should not yield same output second condition was non zero input should not yield zero output now here non zero input yielded zero output so this is not an invertible system non invertible right fine so uh, we've discussed all the subjective questions of shom series hope uh, this video is helpful if you have any queries any doubts any suggestions please leave us in comments thank you